The Children's Place is proud to support Reading Rainbow. A place to grow. The Children's Place. Reading Rainbow is also made possible by a ready-to-learn television cooperative agreement from the U.S. Department of Education through the Public Broadcasting Service and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Butterfly in the sky I can go twice as high Take a look It's in a book driving in one of the hottest, driest deserts around. It's called Indian Canyons, just outside of Palm Springs, California. Now, not too far from here, in the middle of this hot spot is a place that's very cool. In fact, it will change the way you think about deserts forever. Uh-oh. I don't like the sound of this at all. finish my journey on foot and get the water I need for my Jeep. Finding water in the desert isn't easy. You really have to know where to look. And sometimes, if you're lucky, you can get a friend to give you a little help. Well, that's what happens to the animals in this book. Alejandro's Gift. Alejandro's Gift. By Richard E. Albert. Illustrated by Sylvia Long. Read by Francisco Rivella. Alejandro's small adobe house stood beside a lonely desert road. Behind the house stood a well and a windmill to pump water from the well for Alejandro and his only companion, a burro. It was a lonely place. Visitors were few. To pass the lonely hours, Alejandro planted a garden. It had carrots, beans, large brown onions, tomatoes and corn. The days went by with little change, until one morning, when there was an unexpected visitor. A ground squirrel crept from the underbrush, drank its fill of water, and scampered away. After it left, Alejandro realized that for those few moments, his loneliness had been forgotten. And because he felt less lonely, Alejandro found himself hoping the squirrel would come again. The squirrel did come again, from time to time, bringing along wood rats, pocket gophers, 
jackrabbits, roadrunners, gila woodpeckers, and thrashers. Even an old desert tortoise could be seen plodding toward the garden. Suddenly, Alejandro found he was rarely lonely. He had only to look up to find a small friend nearby. He soon realized that his tiny desert friends came to his garden not for company, but for water. And he found himself thinking of the other animals in the desert. Animals like the coyote, the desert gray fox, the antlered mule deer, the bobcats. With his windmill and well, Alejandro could supply ample water for any and all. So, Alejandro decided to dig a desert water hole. Digging was tiring work, but the thought of giving water to so many thirsty animals more than made up for the drudgery. And when it was filled, Alejandro was pleased with the gift he had made for his desert friends. Days passed, and it was still quiet at the water hole. Why, Alejandro wondered, weren't the animals coming? What could he have done wrong? One morning, Alejandro saw a skunk in the clearing beyond the water hole. But when the skunk saw Alejandro, he darted to safety in the underbrush. It suddenly became very clear why Alejandro's gift was not accepted. He dug another water hole far from the house and hidden by heavy desert growth. When it was filled and ready, Alejandro waited. As it turned out, he was not disappointed. The animals of the desert did come because the water hole was now sheltered from the house and the road, and the animals were no longer fearful. And although Alejandro could not see through the desert growth surrounding the water hole, he had ways of knowing the animals were coming. By the twitter of birds gathering in the dusk, by the rustling of mesquite in the quiet desert evening, or the unmistakable sound of a herd of peccaries charging toward the water hole. And in these moments, when Alejandro sat quietly, listening to the sounds of his desert neighbors, he knew that the gift was not so much a gift that he had given, but a gift he had received. Alejandro gave his animal friends nature's most precious gift, water. All animals need water to survive, and the ways they find it and use it can be pretty clever. 
long-necked ostriches have to dip and dunk to get their fill of water. Thanks to its talented trunk, an elephant can take a bath in a puddle like this. <laughs> Don't forget to wash those toes. It may look simple for a giraffe to take a drink, but actually, it's quite a stretch. This cactus catches water for a tree finch to drink. A trio of gazelles drinks very carefully. After all, you never know who else may be around. Raccoons use water to wash up before dinner. And that's the water story from A to Zebra. Out here, in the middle of the desert, it's hard to imagine that you could find water. But when you see trees with big green leaves on them, like those over there, well, you know there's water nearby. That's an oasis, a place where water flows right through the desert. And that's exactly where we're headed. I actually had a little bit of car trouble. Engine overheated. <laughs> yep. That happens a lot in the desert. This is Morgan Levine. She's a naturalist and she knows every corner of this oasis and the desert around it. Now Morgan, this place is remarkably beautiful, but tell me, how did all of this water get here in the desert? This water is from three different places. Uh, it's from snow melting up on the mountain. Mm -hmm. It's from mountain springs. And it's also from hot mineral springs bubbling up from underground. Hmm. And because there is water here, people could live here. Native Americans, the Kahuya tribe, lived here for thousands of years. Now, certainly they needed more than just this water to survive here. Yes, they needed animals, they needed plants, and the oasis provides everything. So their whole lifestyle was, was based on things that they could gather and, and use right here on the oasis. That's right, and this water made it all possible. Alavar, this is a group of palms that really shows the action of the water. What do you mean? The water comes through here with tremendous force. Mm -hmm. If we lived here more than 100 years ago and we came back here, we would wonder, where is the ground? Because when these palm trees began to grow, this is where the soil was. And now, look where the soil is. Now, why are the trunks of these trees all black? The Kahuya people fired these palms on purpose. Hmm. They lived under these trees. And this palm tree will keep its skirts, its dead leaves, sometimes we call them the petticoats, unless they've been in a fire. So if you set them on fire, it would make it brighter and warmer and get rid of all the leaves on the ground. But the most important thing it did for this palm tree is it improved the fruit. You can see fruit from the top of the tree here. And every few years, if you fire the palm, you get more fruit and better fruit. Now, what other uses did the Kahuya have for the palm? Well, they would use the leaf of the palm as the roof of their house. Uh -huh. It's windproof and waterproof. They also made some baskets from this. They made stirring sticks and spoons. And they even made their sandals from the palm tree. I like to think of this canyon as a great big supermarket, and right now we're in one of my favorite aisles. <laughs> this plant is called the Yerba Santa. Yerba Santa. Wow, oh, look at these leaves. They're sort of velvety, aren't they? They are. So what did they use this plant for? This was used to treat colds. They made cough syrup out of this. Really? Uh -huh. And how did they do that? They would boil it and uh, take it like you would take cough syrup every few hours. Uh -huh. 
They would also make it into teas and they would chew this. Try it. Mmm, kind of gummy, isn't it? And you won't be so thirsty if you chew that. It, it has a lot of water in it. It does. It's a little bitter. Uh-huh. And what's this bush over here? This is called the four wing salt bush. And they call it this because if you look at it, each little seed looks like it has four wings. They would pound this into flour that tasted a little bit salty. They would also boil up the stems and the leaves if they had head colds and they would inhale the steam and this would open your head up a little bit. And when you wanted to wash your clothes, they got soap from this. Really? It was used for soap as well? This is the detergent aisle. Now, Morgan, if you'd have to say there was one most important bush or tree in the oasis, what would that be? Well, let me show it to you. Okay. This is the mesquite tree. Uh -huh. And of all the plants in this canyon, this is the one that was most important to the tribe. They knew there was water here because there are mesquite trees here. The roots go down up to 180 feet, but they have to have their feet in water. And this was used for so many different things. It was the framework of the house. It was what they made their bows out of for their bows and arrows. They used the sap out of this tree to make eye wash and to treat wounds. They would use the thorns of the mesquite to make facial tattoos, and of course, the, uh, the food from the tree. The flowers are edible and storable, and they turn into these pods. These pods are nutritionally the equivalent of butter. So what does this taste like? Give it a taste, you tell me. It's really crunchy, isn't it? Mmm, and it's got a sweet flavor. That's why they call this the honey mesquite. The honey mesquite, that makes sense. Now, is this the only way they ate the mesquite, this raw form? They prepared it in many ways, this and other things, in a place we call the kitchen. This is the kitchen, LeVar. Uh -huh. And uh, besides eating these mesquite beans just right off the tree, you could also make flour out of them. So you would come here, take some mesquite beans, put them in this mortar hole. This is called a mortar hole. Mm -hmm. And with this pestle stone, they would pound the mesquite beans into flour. Not only did they pound mesquite, but also fruit of palm and acorns. And each one of these holes belonged to a family. You could even cook in these when they got deep enough. After many generations, they get so deep, you could put hot stones in the bottom and strips of meat on top of that and make it into a sort of a little cooker. So these holes were actually worn into this rock over time like this. After many generations, yes. And if you were a grandmother, you would be passing your mortar hole down to your granddaughter. Now, does the ground up mesquite have a different flavor than the mesquite bean itself? I think it does. Would you like to try some? Yes, I would. So this is the ground up mesquite, huh? Uh-huh. Mmm. Mmm, that's good. Kind of a nutty flavor, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good. You could put this in soup or you could make something that was almost like an oatmeal from it. Mm -hmm. Really good. This was eaten almost every day by the tribe. Wow. Well, I know why they call this a kitchen. This is really hot here. Since we're at the oasis, let's find someplace cooler to hang out. Yes. Okay? Morgan, thank you so much for the tour of the oasis. I really enjoyed this. Me too. Thanks for coming. And don't forget some water for your Jeep. <laughs> That's right. I won't. Flowing water is one of the most powerful forces on Earth. Even a little bit like this can make a huge difference. But there are some places where the water rushes with such force, it puts on a spectacular show. This is Niagara Falls, one of the wettest and wildest places on Earth. 750,000 gallons of water pour over these falls in a single second. That's enough water to fill 21,000 bathtubs or flush 125,000 toilets or brush your teeth 
one and one half million times. Water from Lake Erie flows down the Niagara River. Then it splits and tumbles over the American Falls and the Horseshoe Falls in Canada. Millions of people come from all over the world for a look. But they don't just watch from a distance. The Maid of the Mist boat gets people right into the spray of the falls that's kicked up when the water crashes against the rocks. And for those who really want to feel the force of the water, the hurricane deck is about as close as you can get. With a short climb, you can get right up next to the falls and get pretty wet too. While the falls provide one of the most spectacular eye-opening shows, much of the Niagara River's water is used to produce energy. Water from the river travels downstream and enters this building. Inside, the force of falling water turns turbines like these to produce electricity. Now you might think that nothing could stop the Niagara River from flowing. But winter can sure slow it down. Icy cold weather can freeze the river. When this happens, icebreakers cruise the river, cracking and crushing the ice to loosen it up so that Niagara Falls can keep cascading 24 hours a day, all year long. Before I head home, I want to make sure I have enough water for me and my Jeep. There, that ought to do it. Well, if you want to learn more about deserts and water, then here are three books that will satisfy your thirst for knowledge. But you don't have to take my word for it. Hi, I'm Jesse. Do you know the water you drank last night is the same water that the dinosaurs drank millions of years ago? This book is called Water, Water Everywhere. It has a lot of neat facts about water. Three-fourths of the Earth is covered by water. It's a good thing, because everybody needs water to live. Most of the water on Earth is salt water, and a lot of the fresh water is frozen. Even though there's water everywhere, not all of it is drinkable. Water changes its form over and over. It can be a liquid, a solid, even a gas. This is one cool photograph. It's a water droplet. This book tells kids why it's important to protect the water that we have. I liked Water, Water Everywhere, and I think you will too. Imagine what it's like to live in a dry, dusty place, and then it starts to rain. It's a celebration, just like reading this book. It rained on the desert today. This book is full of wonderful poetry. The pictures are absolutely beautiful. Here the girl is watching for the storm clouds to gather. There's the blinding flash of lightning. There's the crack of thunder. It's raining. To the children, the rain is like music. The little ones play in the mud. The book calls them mud babies. The girl goes to sleep, thankful for the rain. I'm Christine. It Rained on the Desert Today is a truly special book. It will make your heart happy. Hi, have you ever heard of a fennec or a jerd? How about a meerkat? These are amazing creatures that you could learn about in the Desert Alphabet Book. This book is filled with creatures that are desert survivors. They need only a little bit of water. 
The Australian water-holding frog, for example, lives deep in the ground. It conserves its energy until the rain falls. Of course, everybody knows about the camel. The elf owl is a really fascinating bird. You're probably wondering what a fennec is. Well, here's the picture. It's a small desert fox. Notice anything? All these creatures begin with a different letter of the alphabet. P is for a palmate gecko, a kind of lizard. The pictures in this book are very colorful, just like the desert. I'm Mahamudul, and I recommend the Desert Alphabet book. You'll enjoy it as much as a cold glass of water on a hot day. When you're in a dry place like this, you realize just how precious water is. When you think about it, there's nothing else on Earth like it. Water brings life to everything around it, and it keeps all of us, people, plants, animals, alive. So let's make every drop count. I'll see you next time. Today's Reading Rainbow books are Alejandro's Gift by Richard E. Albert, illustrated by Sylvia Long, published by Chronicle Books. Water, Water, Everywhere by Mark J. Ruzan and Cynthia Overbeck Bix, published by Sierra Club Books for Children. It Rained on the Desert Today, written by Ken and Debbie Buchanan, illustrated by Libba Tracy, published by Northland Publishing Company. The Desert Alphabet Book by Jerry Pilata, illustrated by Mark Estrella, published by Charles Bridge Publishing. Hi, I'm LeVar Burton. In uncertain times, there's no more effective way to make your kids feel good and safe than to spend time with them. We at Reading Rainbow suggest sharing a book with your family. Read for fun, read for family, read for our future. The Children's Place is proud to support Reading Rainbow a place to grow. The Children's Place. Reading Rainbow is also made possible by a ready-to-learn television cooperative agreement from the U.S. Department of Education through the Public Broadcasting Service and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Doink! 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 Doink!